Today's old textbook is this one, the International Correspondence School's uh, Inorganic Chemistry Reference Book. So if we open the book, ooh, you, you don't often get inlays like this anymore. <laughs> it's very Victorian slash Edwardian, and that's because the International Correspondence School was founded in the 1880s, late 1880s, and it was a distance learning college which basically is very similar to the Open University but predates it by the you know, best part of 80 years. Let's check the date. It is originally 1898 by the Colliery Engineer Company, so uh, this was printed in the UK and copyrighted here, not America. And this printing, uh, 1915. So this is a very interesting time for chemistry, uh, between about 18... 98 to 1915 uh, because what was definitely known well atomic theory is pretty much sorted uh, the elements were listed and tabulated and more complete than they'd ever been but things were about to change we didn't really know about the proton the electron we didn't know about the atomic structure so 1914 roughly was when Marsden and Geiger and Rutherford were doing their experiments to show that the atom is a solid nucleus or it's a very dense nucleus surrounded by a much less dense cloud of electrons. So what you don't find in this book is any reference to that. There is no mention of um, electrons and protons. They weren't really known to be part of the atom or at least or at least where they were known to be part of the atom it was a bit hazy how that all fitted together. So let's have a, just a flick through and see what we can look at. So, so this is basic chemistry not, uh, this is what we might call general chemistry if you're in the US system rather than necessarily inorganic chemistry, but when we flip around, uh, it is more inorganic. So it really just lists elements and kind of what they do. If we flip through it, uh, compounds of oxygen with hydrogen, well, that's usually H2O, isn't it? Lots of preparations. Preparation. Water occurs so plentifully in nature that, except when required for chemical purposes, no special processes of preparation are necessarily true, although we might want to deionize it occasionally. But most of this is just lists and lists of uh, materials. Now, rather interestingly, we are at the stage where we do know that, that atoms exist and that those are the best way of describing things, but these aren't really structures as we would normally recognize them. They are talking about connectivity certainly, but we probably wouldn't draw a linear water uh, these days. And the structure of ammonia is sort of there, but it is, you know, this is not like it's an atom with three bonds coming up to it. It's sort of just showing connectivity. So this is still a little bit uh, early. In early times, there were two views held in regard to the constitution of matter. One of these was that all matter was continuous and therefore capable of infinite subdivision. Uh, now, that is continuous matter. It's a theory that's been rejected for a long time, but it was still kind of controversial through most of the 19th century. Uh, even when Mendeleev was assembling his periodic table, uh, he kind of rejected the idea of atoms uh, for at least another decade or two after he got like famous in 1869 for publishing the periodic table. Um, but by this point in 1915-ish, atoms are, are pretty much solid. Um, now this, is, this theory is incapable of direct proof, but how the observed facts fit in. We do have more direct proof of atoms now. Um, Famously, people credit one of Einstein's calculations with Brownian motion to particles and atoms. Uh, we have spectroscopic evidence, we have um, atomic force microscopy that can actually image individual atoms. And then once we've got the idea of what an element is or an atom, uh, we start trying to figure out what a molecule is. There will finally be obtained an extremely minute particle that cannot be further subdivided by mechanical means, and this is known as a molecule. So that's the older definition of a molecule. We wouldn't necessarily use that now. Our EPAC's definition, uh, it's got two. It's got molecular entity, which is something involving more than one atom, and molecule, which involves more than one atom as well, um, but is a bit broader in scope. And its broader scope is that it's got to be more than uh, two or more atoms 
that are bound together tightly enough to host a vibrational state, which is a an odd sounding definition if you don't know chemistry, but if you into the chemical physics or physical chemistry, that's actually a really interesting definition of a molecule, um, because if it doesn't vibrate, uh, they're not bound tightly enough. So a molecule may therefore be defined as the smallest portion of matter obtainable by mechanical or physical subdivision, or the smallest particle of matter having the properties of the original substance. Now that's an interesting definition because that is kind of not correct because properties of substances do depend on their scale. So for instance, gold, you would say a property of gold is that it is well, gold colored, it is yellow and it is shiny. But that's a property of the substance being in bulk. If you cut gold down to gold nanoparticles, they're actually red or purple depending on their, their size. And that's the red or purple that are in lateral flow tests. Uh, they're gold nanoparticles bound to antigens. The word atom means indivisible or undivided. In use, this term is applied to the smallest divisions of matter that can be obtained by most refined methods at present known to the chemist. Uh, so an atom is the smallest particle of an element which can be obtained by chemical substance. Uh, subdivision and that's useful because around about this time we are we are entering the age of like nuclear uh, physics existing uh, we know that the atoms can be radioactive they can break apart and maybe change and this is a really transitional moment in science uh, where we are trying to figure out can the atom be split so this is kind of hinting that maybe the atom can be split because we're using chemical subdivision as the definition so let's have a look. This is interesting. Uh, glass rods, glass blowing is in this. Um, we don't do much of our own glass blowing anymore. You get dedicated glass blowers who know what they are doing to do this. Um, generally speaking, we don't because it's it's difficult, it's time consuming, and you can hurt yourself if you don't know what you're doing. So becoming a properly experienced glass blower takes like a decade at least. What else earlier? The balance. This is really interesting because I actually have a balance that looks like this in this office uh, just over there in the corner. Um, it's very old school, it's very hard to use. Here at the bottom is quite good. Every chemist should keep his balance and weight sacred and should treat them with the greatest care and consideration. Nowadays, we just throw it onto a single pan balance and a digital readout tells us how much it weighs. So, um, other practical stuff, decantation. Decantation? Well, I don't think I've ever said that out loud. Filtration, it's kind of separating. A couple of really nice diagrams uh, of some purification uh, and gas purification, which is really nice. What have we got here? Ah, here we go. This sulfur and chlorine. So, we've got uh, sulfuric acid here. And yeah, we're getting kind of a hint at structure appearing. Right, so sulfur in the middle, uh, two double bonds to oxygen, a single bond to the acidic OH groups there. That's kind of how we draw it now. It feels like the limitation is what can the technology of the time do to show these structures. So you have to remember that we got these structures without any kind of spectroscopy or X-ray diffraction at this time. Rather interestingly, it doesn't go into any theory that unifies this. There's very, there aren't really mentions of oxidation state in here. Uh, we would, we probably would not talk about inorganic chemistry without talking about oxidation states and how things can combine together. And that's kind of a side effect of the fact that the periodic table was still kind of in its infancy, and we didn't really know atomic structure at all, and that all informs. Uh, how these things put together. Ooh. We've at least um, got some organisation here. So this is family 2, group B, uh, consists of the metals zinc, cadmium and mercury. Okay, so we will flip back and we'll find what I think is the most interesting part of this. The big table here, I just flicked past it, it has to be pulled out. And here it is. That's the periodic table of 1898 to 1915-ish, but you can see it doesn't look anything like a modern periodic table at all. And I have done an animation for how this works um, to separate them out, because you can see this is mostly um, P-block elements, mostly. But then 
interleaved uh, between them are the D-block elements. And that is sort of a, a consequence of not really knowing electronic structure. If you don't know the electrons, if you don't know atomic orbitals, if you don't know uh, quantum mechanics, you can't make sense of that. The pairing table reflects kind of the electronic structure of an atom according to quantum theory and uh, the spherical harmonics that the electrons follow. And if all you've got to go on is their reactivity and their mass, this is how you make sense of that. Any of the discrepancies within the groups are solved by pushing them from group A to group B. So for instance, here on the right, we've got fluorine, chlorine, uh, bromine, iodine, and still in group seven, manganese. Big red flag that something is wrong there. And then group eight, um, all these other metals. And over here, you can tell this is a bit later than Mendeleev uh, because it has group zero. Here we are, helium, neon, argon, with just an A rather than an AR. Krypton, xenon, the noble gases, they have all been found by this point. So when the periodic table was first assembled in 1869 to 1871-ish, the noble gases weren't around. They were about a decade or two away from being observed. So there was an assumption that 1% of air was something else, and then it was identified as argon after that, and then the rest fell into place quite quickly. Uh, helium being the interesting one because it was observed in the solar spectra before it was discovered on Earth. So we knew that helium existed from spectroscopic evidence before we knew, well, before we could isolate it. So this is in here. Now in a modern layout, this is no longer group zero, it is group eight slash 18, all the way on the right. Uh, and there were various assumptions about what group zero could mean uh, at the time, uh, before these were even uh, discovered, group zero was kind of hypothesized as something that is lighter than hydrogen. In fact, uh, Mendeleev left a space on the left for something lighter than hydrogen. I uh, made that assumption. Um, because, of course, Mendeleev didn't believe um, in atoms at the time he proposed that. He thought, oh, well, there's going to be something even lighter, even lighter than that. We'll put it in group zero. Maybe there's another row on top of this. Now, what is really interesting here turn the page over, I looked at this a little bit earlier, um, they do mention Mendeleev, written, uh, anglicised a different way to how we normally do it, without the B. They also credit Lothar Meyer a lot, in fact uh, this is Meyer's table, not Mendeleev's. Um, so the book seems to be uh, more happy with crediting the German scientists rather than the Russian scientists for this. They kind of independently stumbled upon the same idea. Uh, arranged slightly differently, but kind of once you took away the formatting, they had the same idea roughly at the same time. This is really on the cusp of modern chemistry forming, so this is kind of the end of like the original chemical era. Uh, here, uh, in atomic weights, this is interesting. It would be obviously be out of place at this time to discuss the method of obtaining atomic weights. Uh, and a little reflection will show that the atoms are much too small to have their absolute weights determined and consequently a standard is selected. And this is really interesting because this was not standardised at the time. How do you measure an atom's mass? It's too light to stick it on a balance. Uh, these are like 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. That's, uh, you can't weigh that. Uh, but you can measure it relative to something else. And do you measure it relative to hydrogen or carbon? And in this case, they're measuring it relative to hydrogen. Now, if you've done school chemistry, you will know that we measure it relative to carbon, and specifically carbon-12. And this predates isotopes, and it predates knowing the exact masses of hydrogen very precisely. So this is the interesting bit of calculation. Right? Uh, hydrogen is taken as one, and it says down here, quite recently, a long series of painstaking experiments has shown that oxygen is 15.88 times as heavy as hydrogen instead of 16 times. Now, 15.88 is not the atomic mass of oxygen. That's actually 15.9994. Yeah, that's fine. Um, but that is 15.88 times the actual atomic mass of hydrogen. So the atomic mass of hydrogen is 1.00. 7, 9, multiply that by 15.88. Within any reasonable error, you're on the actual atomic mass that's currently accepted for 
oxygen. So that is a consequence of those masses being measured relative to carbon and carbon-12 specifically. And now we define them kind of by definition by setting Avogadro's constant to be a set number instead of empirical. There aren't really any glaring errors throughout this. We haven't fundamentally upset chemistry since here. Just how we talk about it has changed. How we do the practicals has changed. How we teach it has changed, certainly. So let's look to the back and look at the examination questions. So, name three materials in which hydrogen occurs. You probably wouldn't phrase a question like that anymore. That's, that's very weird. Uh, give some of the properties of oxygen. Where does oxygen occur? Um, where does water occur? Give some properties of ozone. Some of these questions are very vague and we definitely would not set questions like this at a higher education level for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, this is a correspondence course textbook. If it is an open book, you just flick to the book and you copy the answer out. And two, they're incredibly vague. Where does water occur? What does that even mean? Do you want to talk about where it forms in the universe? Where it's found? Is it found in clouds? Does it occur in in oceans? Does it occur in cells? I, I don't know. This is really hard to actually interpret what the questions mean. Here we go. What? Define matter. That's one for the physicists to talk about right now. If you can do it in terms of what we knew in 1915 and what we know in 2022, uh, that would be really interesting to compare. How many cu cubic centimetres are contained in one litre? Well, I mean, I know modern undergraduates can't figure that one out very easily. Define a molecule or an atom. Which, which definition? Because they actually have several in the book, remember? So these questions are very very vague and very... Uh, you either have to memorise the entire book to uh, to answer these questions or you look it up in the book, which is kind of weird because these days we would address problem solving. It would be here is a reaction that you haven't seen before. Use the rules that you have learned from the previous examples to kind of tell me about it. And that is more the question that we'd use uh, at degree level now. So mail your work on this lesson as soon as you have finished it and looked it over carefully. Do not hold it until another lesson is ready. Now, the International Correspondence School is still going and the Penn Career School is still going. So will they accept a 106 years late submission? That's the question.